turn to Genesis chapter 11. I mentioned that probably we'll be going through themes out of Genesis, and here we go again, another passage out of Genesis chapter 11. But what I'm talking about goes much bigger than Genesis. In fact, it's impossible to preach one verse of the Bible and not bring in other passages of the Bible. If you're doing that, you're not preaching the Word of God. You're preaching the doctrines of men. You're preaching the philosophy of men. And, but when you preach the Word of God, it all connects. And it has to connect. And it connects to a bigger picture. We mentioned last time, I think in our Chinese Bible study, the whole book of um, Genesis is about Jesus Christ. In fact, the whole Old Testament is actually about Jesus Christ, and he himself said that. And so when we look at these individual passages, we know that it has a much greater meaning than what is written, but we start with what is written. So we're going to do a comparison of two men, two men, or two kingdoms. So in Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 1, I'm going to read down to verse 9. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. This is the story of the Tower of Babel. Actually, no, it's not. This is the story of the history of mankind. It's all encompassed and this short little passage. See, we can find all of human history right here. We have to bring a few other verses in, but we can condense the entire history of the world and a couple passages of Scripture out of Genesis. We have man saying, come, let us, us, let us men, without God, without prayer, without divine assistance, without worship, without faith, without God's word, come let us build ourselves a city. They say, come let us, in, in the verse 3, come let us make bricks and bake them through. And then again in verse 4, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Come let us. No God, no faith, no prayer, no d divine guidance, no, no revelation, no scripture, no, no plan of God. Come let us. Why? It seems good to us because it's what we want. It's what I want to do. It's what my family wants to do. It's what our culture wants to do. It's what our nation. Come let us build. Come let us do it. And it seemed like the most natural thing in the world. Come let us do it. And they said, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do it. Let's build ourselves a city. Let's build ourselves a great and glorious kingdom of comfort, an inheritance in this world. Luxury, pleasure, comfort, ease. No God, no faith, no revelation, no prayer. Nothing, no greater purpose. Just let us build ourselves a kingdom. Let us eat, let us drink, and let us be merry, for tomorrow we die. This is the motto of, 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 of mankind. This is the summary of all of human history. Let's build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name. Here we go again. Let us 
make a name for ourselves. Let us be famous. Let us be exalted in our own eyes. Let us be great. Let us be praised. And then there's this final part here. Lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. First point I want to make today is that man is building his own kingdom. The drive of the human spirit is to build his own kingdom in this life now. The drive of the human spirit is to promote his own name and own fame here in this life now. And the drive of the human spirit is to directly resist God and His plan and His commandment and His purpose and do His own will. We see in this little section three areas of direct rebellion against God. First one is, come let us. Come let us. Come let us. No mention of God. No mention of prayer. No mention of revelation, guidance, nothing. Everything is centered around us. Our wants, our feelings, our needs, our lives, our future, our children. Come let us. That's humanism. Where did the doctrine of humanism begin? Right here. <laughs> humanism. Man at the center of everything. The other area of direct rebellion is they want to build, they say, let us um, make a name for ourselves. Let us promote our name. Let us be famous. Let humanity be great, prosperous, praiseworthy. And the other area of direct rebellion is they said, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Why is that direct rebellion? Well, if you go back in Genesis chapter 1, you see that God actually told Adam and Eve in chapter 1, verse 28, to fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, etc., etc. He told them to go forth, fill the earth. Fill the earth, subdue the earth. God had a direct command and a direct plan for what they were to do. They were to fill the earth. They were to be fruitful. They were to multiply. They were to fill the, the earth and to subdue it. They were to, to, to expand God's, uh, God's dominion over all the face of the earth. But the people of Babel said, no, we will not do God's plan. We will not do God's will. We'll stop. We're not going to be scattered out there over the face of the earth. We're going to stop right here. We found a comfortable place. And we're going to build our own kingdom. And we're going to become famous in our own eyes. And we're going to directly resist and rebel against God's divine commandment. We're not going to do it. Why are we going to do that? We're living for ourselves. We're living for our own name, our own fame, our own comfort. We're building our own kingdom. This is the drive of every single human born on the face of the earth from birth. This is the story of all of human history. Well, it's the first part. We haven't got to the second yet. Man is driven to build his own kingdom, to establish his own fame, to promote his own name, and not fulfill God's plan. That's it. That's humanity. That describes the entire face of of the earth. It doesn't matter what race, it doesn't matter what country, it doesn't matter what culture. This is what's wrong with this world. So we could look at it like this. In the first part we see man is building. Building his own city, his own inheritance, Man is promoting, promoting his own name, his own culture, his own values, his own glory. And man is resisting 
the fulfillment of God's greater plan, that he might maintain his own plan in this life. The second part, verse 5, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Some say that this is kind of like a mockery because they said they're going to build a tower that goes to the heavens, but the Lord has to come down to even see the tower. It's so small in God's eyes. It might be there. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they, propose, they begin to do. Now nothing that they pro pro propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us. Interesting, isn't it? In the first part, it's like, come let us, come let us, come let us. Now we have God say, no, come let us go down. And go down in there, confuse their language. Kind of shows who's boss, doesn't it? It kind of shows who the Lord is, doesn't it? It kind of shows who's the Lord of all history, doesn't it? Who's really in charge, who's really in control, who really has the final say. No matter how exalted man may be, no matter how great the kingdoms of this world may become, at the end of the day, God alone has the final say. Come, let us go down there, go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. It's kind of a mockery, isn't it? It's kind of like showing how ridiculous mankind is in his craftiness and his cleverness and his, and his conceitedness and in his pride. Actually, God just has to come down and, and, and confuse the language. and They can't even talk to each other. They're, they're, they're speechless. They're, they're made completely mute in a sense. So the Lord, and then look at verse 8. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth. They will fulfill my plan. They will go to the ends of the earth whether they like it or not. God's will will be done. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the languages of the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. This is the condensed version of all of human history. What is it? Man builds and God tears down. That's what's been going on now for thousands of years in this world. What? This kingdom, that kingdom? No, 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 just forget all that. What's been happening is this. Man builds and God tears down. Man exalts himself and God humbles him. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter how powerful, how rich, how wealthy. They're all rotting in the grave today. Every single one of them rotting in the grave. It doesn't matter what kingdom, the kingdom of Egypt, uh, Babylon, Assyria, the greatest kingdoms in all of world history. Where are they today? They're rotting in the grave. Why? Because man builds and God tears down. And it goes on to this day. Men spend their whole lives to be good at one thing so that they can be famous, make a lot of money, have a good reputation, and live a comfortable life. What is that? They're building their own kingdom. They're refusing to do the will of God. They're saying, no, I'm not going out to the ends of the earth. I'm not doing the will of God. I'm not fulfilling the plan of God. I'm going to do my own thing my way now. We're not going to go. We're going to stay here and build our own city. We're going to stay here and build our own tower to heaven. And God comes down in confusion, scattered, ruin. Everyone who lives to build their own kingdom is sooner or later going to experience confusion, ruin, and being scattered and left with nothing. From dust to dust, with nothing left to show for. That's the history of of this world and that's what continues to happen to this very day men rise up and God puts them down men build and God destroys he tears it all down he throws it into the dust he's 
scatters it in confusion. Why? Because they're trying to build their own city. Because they're trying to promote, promote their own name. Because they're directly resisting the plan of God for their lives. This is the history of the world out of one passage of the Bible. This is human nature spoken of from one tiny section of the whole Bible. It's right there. The ambition, the drive, the self-reliance, the desire for glory, the desire for wealth and comfort and prosperity. The resistance of God and His plan and His will and His purpose. Can you see yourself in Babel? Or better said, can you see Babel in yourself? Do you know there was nothing particularly wicked about those people? They're just like everybody else born on the face of the earth. That's the drive of the human spirit. Live for self, our own pleasure, our own comfort, our own glory, and our own plan. Well, sometimes we, we kind of What's that word? Show guy. We kind of show sure. We kind of, um, I can't think of the word. Disguise it a bit. We disguise it a bit. We throw God in the picture, but it's the same thing in our spirit, the same drive in our heart. We just put God in there and say, God, bless me. It's still for me, my glory, and my plan but we like to bring God into it and say, God bless me and my, my glory, my plan, my kingdom. God, help me that I can be great. No, it doesn't work like that. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 12. I mentioned a comparison of two men. It's actually not a comparison of two men, but it is a comparison of two incidents we see here that these chapters are right next to each other. These accounts are right next to each other. We see what they said in Babel. We see how they were going forth and they found a plain in the land of Shinar and, uh, and they dwelt there. And then they said, come let us, come let us, come let us. Build our own selves a city, a tower. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered over the face of the earth. And we saw God came on the scene and said, no, you're not going to do it. I'm going to tear it all down. He confused them, and he scattered them. And the thing turned to rubble and dust. And the plans of men will always turn to rubble and dust and confusion. But we have this interesting account here in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you see the contrast there with uh, chapter 11? The Babyl Babylonians, not Babylonians, those are people from Babylon, but I'm going to call them the Babylonians, from the people of Babel. They said, let us, no God, no prayer, no scripture, no revelation, let us come and build our own city, promote our own name, and not be scattered. And then we have Abraham. God says, get out of here. Get out of this place. Get out of your country. Go from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who curse you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And verse 4, so Abraham... Abram departed. 
hearted as the Lord had spoken to him. He obeyed. You see the difference here? We have man wanting to build his own kingdom, promote his own name, and disobey God. And now we have God speaking to a man and God building his kingdom through a man. And God is going to promote his name through this man. The uh, Babylonians <laughs> went out in their own name, at their own, inst- at their own instigation, their own desire, stopped where they liked, attempted to build their own kingdom there, and promote their own name there. But here we have Abraham commanded by God, no, leave. So now he's going. So he's obeying the first part. Go, fill the earth and subdue it to a land that I will show you. So now it's God indicating where he's supposed to go. It's not him just picking and choosing whatever he likes. God has a plan. And then God says, I will make you a great nation. It wasn't saying, I'm going to become a great nation. I'm going to build my own name. No. God is going to build his own nation. And I will make your name great. God's going to do it. God's going to raise up Abraham. God's going to make Abraham his servant, his representative. And he shall be a blessing. So we see a couple things here. First is all of human history condensed. Well, a great portion of human history condensed in nine verses. Man attempting to build, God tearing down and scattering. Then, this is the other part that's very important. Man is trying to build, and God is tearing down, but God is building his kingdom. That's what we see here. Man tried to build his own kingdom. God scattered them and said, no, I will build my kingdom. And God has been building that kingdom ever since. He's never stopped doing it. Abraham was just the start of it. Man's never stopped trying to build his. That's why God keeps tearing it down. That's why nations rise and nations fall. That's why great men rise and great men fall. That's why these great famous musicians, they are, they're great and whatever, and then they rot in the grave. That's why these famous, uh, whatever it may be, uh, uh, athletes or, or famous, um, doesn't matter, actors or whatever, they rise and they fall and they rot in the grave. It's always going to be that way because God will not permit man to succeed. Man's going to keep trying to build his own kingdom. The people around you are going to try to build their own kingdom. They're going to try to build their own inheritance and promote their own name. And they directly say, I will not be scattered over the face of the earth. In other words, I will not do the will of God. I will not serve God. I will not submit my life to God. I will stay where I want to stay. I will do what I want to do. You know what? Most of the people around you are going to do that the rest of their lives. That's what they're doing right now. That's what they're going to do tomorrow. That's what they're going to do next year. That's all they care about. That's what they want. That's what they desire. That's the drive in their spirit. They're not special. Fu Qingren are not special. That's the drive in every single culture, nation. Doesn't matter. Not just the Chinese are like this driven race. All the races are driven, but only in different ways. But it's the same drive. Me, myself, and I, my kingdom, my name, I'll do what I want to do. No God. No prayer. No revelation. They're just following whatever they think is best in their own eyes. And normally it's what's been passed down from their family before them. And they just go from generation to generation, trying again and failing and rotting in the grave. Trying again and failing, rotting in the grave. Try to build their own kingdom, fail. And, you, and this generation is going to try it again. 
they know the fat past generation. They know some, some businessman made all his money, but in the end he died in, in misery or he, his family left him or he lost all his money. But they say, well, it'll be different with me. They're, they're, and they're going to try again. They're going to try to build their own kingdom, build their own family, and they're going to fail. God's, why? Because God's against them. Why is God against them? Because they're trying to promote their own name. They're trying to do their own thing. But God made them for his own purpose, and God has a plan, and they don't want to do it. So, of course, God's going to enter in. God's going to directly come down and scatter them in confusion and tear down their monuments, tear down their statues, tear down their reputations, tear apart their wealth, and throw it away, scatter it, give it to the poor or something else. But God is building his kingdom. It's an eternal kingdom. In Psalm 145, 13, it says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Your kingdom, Psalm 145, 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all all generations. God is building his kingdom. And he doesn't need our assistance. And Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, 18, I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God is building an invincible kingdom that cannot and will not be shaken. An eternal kingdom. God's building. God's house. For God's name and God's plan. That's what the church is supposed to be, a community of people who are living and serving and dying to promote God's name, to promote God's plan and do God's will on earth as it is in heaven. That's what the church is supposed to be. God's children in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation who have given themselves like Abraham and say, here am I. Or like Isaiah, here am I, send me. Or God says, go, and he goes. He goes. Okay, I'll go. I'll serve God. Let God build his kingdom through me. Let God promote his name through me. Let God accomplish his purposes through me. I'm not going to build my own kingdom. I'm not going to seek my own fame. I'm not going to resist the will of God. I lay down my life. I deny myself. I take up my cross. I follow Jesus. That's what the church is supposed to be. A community, a community of people who are dedicated entirely to doing the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. To become the servants in God's house, the workers that God works through to build this eternal kingdom. We are not supposed to be living for ourselves. We're not supposed to be living for our own plans anymore, for our own own values, our own whatever it may be, pursuits. We're not supposed to be living for that anymore. We're supposed to be dead to the world and alive to Christ. We're not supposed to be thinking about things on earth here below, but on things on, on in heaven above. That's what the Bible teaches all the way through it from beginning to end. People like to say, oh, but Abraham was very wealthy and all this. Yeah, but what was it for? It was for a divine purpose. Even the offering they took in, uh, the, the money they got in Egypt when they, when they were taken out through the Exodus, the, all that money later was given to build the temple in the, the, the tabernacle in the wilderness. The, the goods, the material things, they were given for a purpose to be used for God's kingdom, to be used for God's name, to be used for God's fame. That's through the whole Bible. There's no, it's, not, it's, it's especially clear in the New Testament, but it's, it's there in the Old as well. Let us not be confused about it. If we're living for ourselves on the final day, we're not going to stand. It's not going to go well for us in the judgment. If we're living for our own plans, our own thoughts, our own purposes, on the day of judgment, it doesn't matter how much you say you believe in Jesus, it's not going to go well for you. Oh, so you say, well, that doesn't apply to me. Oh, so you're not a, you've never been a Babylonian? 
So you're not a human? You were not born with that drive to build your own kingdom, promote your own reputation, and to resist the will of God and do what you want to do? Oh, you were born different from the rest of us, I guess, huh? No, no, you weren't. We're all born the same. We all have to deny ourselves. Why? Because self wants to do what self wants to do. That's why Jesus was so strong on these points, because he knew what was in a man. He knew what human nature was like. He knew they're living to serve their flesh and to build their own kingdom and to promote their own name and resist God's will for their lives. That's human nature. So we have to recognize it and turn away from it and submit ourselves to God and pursue God and do His will. God is building his own kingdom. Question is, whose kingdom are we living for? Man's kingdom or God's? Let's not answer the question so quickly. Let's take a moment and think about it. What are we pursuing? What are we desiring? What do we think about when we're not in church You see, there's two type of men in the world. There's Jacob's and there's Esau's. There's two incidents that represent all of human history. The Tower of Babel and the call of Abraham. Man's attempt and what God is doing. Man's attempt, build his own kingdom, build his own re re reputation, and resist God. What, God's, what is God doing? God is calling a man. Get out from your family. Get, leave those people. Why? Because I'm going to separate you and make you a new nation. Because I'm going to build my kingdom through you, in you, and through you. Get out. Leave. And I will make you a nation. I will make your name great. I will bless you and make you a blessing. God's going to do it. Abraham becomes the obedient servant. But there's two men. There's a Jacob and there's an Esau. There's a very scary verse in Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1, verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. This is God speaking to his people. Yet you say, in what way have you loved us? And God says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. This verse has brought a lot of controversy uh, because it's used again in, in Romans chapter 9. I'm not going to go into that aspect of it today, but I want to draw out of this verse what's very clear and fits exactly with what we're talking about today. How did God love Israel? Well, he shows them here because he says, yet, yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. And he shows them how he hated Esau or how that was displayed and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the ter territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. God loved Jacob. God hated Esau. He, when he says Esau, he means the people of Edom, the descendants, the nation of Esau. But what does it represent? What sort of a man was Esau? He was a man that sold his inheritance for a bowl of lentils, okay? He had no spiritual value. He had no interest in the things of God. He had no interest in, in the inheritance that God had given through his father. He sold it for material, physical, carnal fulfillment. That's it. The New Testament calls him a fornicator. 
even though he wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't actually a, a sin of that sort in that time, but he's using the strongest word possible to show what sort of a man sells his entire spiritual inheritance for a bowl of soup. The sort of man whose descendants or whose nation God is totally against. So what I want to say here, and I believe this is the way this works, what it means that God hates Esau is that God always is against the Babylonians, those that will build their own name, those that will build their own kingdom, those that will live according to the flesh. No God, no prayer, no Bible, no nothing. Just us, just us. Come let us, come let us. You're an enemy of God and God will tear you down. So God showed his love to Israel here. Jacob represents Israel. Esau represents Edom, Edomites. And that though Israel failed and fell and came under judgment, but God rebuilt them every time. God restored them. God showed them mercy when they repented, but not the Edomites, no. Why? They're eternally under a curse. Why? They're the flesh. They're the flesh. The flesh. The flesh is always going to be under a curse. There's no restoration for the flesh. There's no restoration for the Babylonians. They have set their heart, they have set their minds and their purpose to resist God and do their own will and promote their own name. They're under a curse. They'll always be under a curse. But there's really, when we look at just these two men, there's only two types of men in the world. There's Jacob's and there's, e there's Esau's. What's Jacob? Jacob's a sinner. Jacob's a sinner. But God spoke to him and he repented. God spoke to him and he responded. God spoke to him and he obeyed and he became the instrument through which God accomplished his plan. And then there's Esau's. What are Esau's? He had the inheritance of God. He had the promise of God and he threw it away for one meal. For carnal, temporal, worldly pleasures. He liked to go out and hunt. He loved the earth. He was a man of the earth. He was a man of the, of the field and, the, and all this. He, he was a man. He was a carnal man. He was a fleshly man. He had no value for spiritual things. He had no eyes to see them. He represents the flesh and the flesh is under a curse, eternally under a curse. What kingdom are you living for today? 1 Corinthians 3. Nine. Paul's discussing here a comparison between himself and Apollos, another Bible teacher. At that time, the people of Corinth were using them to kind of pit them against each other and pick which side they liked. But Paul uses this here, um, verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. God is building his kingdom. Paul was simply a servant. Apollos was simply a servant. God worked through them to build his kingdom. They're not building their own kingdom. They're not building their own name. They're not doing their own will. They're doing God's will, building his kingdom, promoting God's name. Verse 12, now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a ward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, 
which temple you are. Now, Paul's using this as a comparison between himself and Apollos, but we can take it and apply it. How are we building? What are we building in our lives? Gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw. It might not be clear in this life, but it will be in that day. It will become clear in that day. Which kingdom are we serving in? Man's or God's? Whose name are we living to promote? Our own or God's? Which man best represents us? Jacob or Esau? Which part of human history, which side of human history are we going to come out on? The side that was torn down and scattered and turned to dust? Or those that do the will of God, as it says in 1 John, and abides forever. 1 John 2, 15 says, Do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. And I would add to that, and God's also tearing it down. And the lust of it fades away. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Let's just go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray today that you will make your, your word clear to us. I pray, Lord God, that you will search our hearts and our lives and help us to make every adjustment necessary, that we will not live for the pride of men or for the will of man, but for the will of God. That we will not live to build our own kingdom, our own comfort, our own name, and do our own will. But we will be like Abraham, hear your voice, forsake the world, forsake everything, follow you, that you will work in us and through us to build your kingdom and to promote your name, that we can be a blessing because you've blessed us. That whatever greatness we have, it's all your greatness that's come upon us as vessels of obedience. Lord, challenge us today Awaken us, stir us out of every sort of delusion of the comforts of this world, the comforts of, of our homes, our families, our lives, our money, whatever it may be. And even if we don't have anything comfortable, but our ambitions, our ambitions for the future, our ambitions for our family, our ambitions for our lives, our ambitions for whatever they are, I pray, God, that you will make everyone here today willing to be converted by the Spirit of God, willing to be circumcised in our hearts by the Spirit of God, willing to have your law written on these tablets of stone, that these stony tablets would become tablets of flesh. I pray, Lord God, that we will separate ourselves from the contamination and the love of this world, that we would not be men of the soil, men of the flesh, men of the field like Esau, Lord, but we would be men like Jacob, a man who was a calm man, a man who dwelt in the tents. He waited, and God spoke to him, and he served, and God used him. I pray, Lord God, that we will be those men that were not that we're not sinners, but when you speak to us and rebuke us for our carnality and our love of the world and our, our pursuit of earthly things, that we will turn away from them and seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That we will be men like Abraham that was apparently going to pursue something, 
But later, he went on to pursue God. And though he was mightily blessed, that's not the significant fact of his life, but that he was a servant of God. He was a friend of God. He was a man of faith. Lord, let that be the story of our lives, whether we are known or unknown, whether we are wealthy or, or poor, whether we are prosperous in this world or not. But Lord, let us be prosperous in that we do the will of God and endure forever. Take our eyes off of temporary things. Take our eyes off of worldly things, our own lusts, our own desires, our own anxieties. Help us, God to lift up our eyes and look and see the fields are ripe unto harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Let us join you in your labors and let us give up our own labors of building our own kingdom, our own name, our own fame, and doing our own will. Let us cease like the Babylonians either way are going to cease, either under God's divine judgment or they're going to turn away and obey like Abraham. Lord, let us be those that hear the voice of God and turn away from building our own kingdoms and promoting our own fame. And let us be those that live forever because we live for your name, your kingdom, your plan, and your will. Lord, I pray you'll bless us. I pray, Lord God, you will bless everyone here today as they hear these words. They will take them to heart and they will apply them. I pray, that, I pray they will be applied by the Holy Spirit and implemented immediately wherever they need to be implemented. There will be no hesitation. There will be no uh, resistance, but immediate acceptance. Surrender to the will of God that we will not be carnal men like Esau, even though we were children of promise by birth. Yet according to divine election, we were rejected as men of the flesh. Let that not be our inheritance, Lord God. Though we are in church as Christians, let us not still live according to the flesh. But let us live according to the Spirit and inherit eternal life. I pray for those that are here, Lord. I pray for those that are not here. I pray, Father God, that you will have mercy on them, that you will help them to see and understand these things and to redeem the time. Take advantage of every opportunity, especially now when they'll be seeing friends and family, to be salt and light if they have opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord God, this time will not be wasted. I pray that these opportunities will be used, Lord. Pray for your mercy, Lord. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.